we'll introduce our guests that we have joining us today. If uh, Tony and Pamela, you'd like to bring your video on. And we today we've got Tony Payan and Pamela Cruz with us. Tony Payan, PhD, is, is the Francois and Edward uh, Jurigian, Jur, Jurigian Fellow for Mexican Studies and Director at the Center for the United States and Mexico at the Baker Institute at Rice University. He's also Adjunct Associate Professor at Rice University and a professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez. Um, he's between 2001 and 2015, Payan was the professor of political science at the University of Texas at El Paso. For you UTEP folks joining us today, I know that will be a welcome to know. Also joining us uh, today is Pamela Lizette Cruz. She's a research analyst for the Baker Institute Center for the United States and Mexico, and she works with the director and affiliated scholars to carry out research on Mexico's policy issues and the US-Mexico relations. Her current project focuses on binational institutional development on the US-Mexico border. So we welcome you both uh, today for your presentation and uh, I uh, thank you very much for joining us and, and we look forward to your presentation. I will get your PowerPoint up momentarily. Go ahead, take it away, Tony and Pamela. There it is. Uh, well, thank you very much. I, um, I, I wanna thank you, Scott, and I wanna thank Christina for your help and the invitation to uh, share our findings of this new book, Binational Commons, Institutional Development and Governance on the US-Mexico border. And I wanna thank the University of Arizona Press as well for working with us on this volume. Uh, we think it's an important volume, unique, and its contribution to understanding how the US-Mexico border is governed. And of course, I want to thank the Ali uh, Institute at, uh, uh, at the University of Arizona. I, I'm quite familiar with the work that you do. Uh, when I was a professor of political science at the University of Texas at El Paso, I um, taught several classes at uh, UTEP. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, uh, and uh, hopefully some of you in the YouTube group uh, might, uh, uh, you know, might have been in the same classroom when I was uh, uh, talking about the US-Mexico border, something that is very dear to my heart and I've done for, for a, a long time, even as I moved from UTEP to Rice University in Houston, Texas. Uh, let me uh, uh, introduce the book to you. You can see the cover there on your screen, but I have a copy of the book here, it's a very good looking cover and it's a very unique title. The very first thing I wanna say is uh, uh, the, the title of the book is meant to evoke in you and in us the idea that the border is a commons. Um, we often uh, remember Garrett Hardin's work, The Tragedy of the Commons um, back in the 1960s. We've read the, the, that work, it's a seminal work on understanding public space in particular, but also public goods as commons. Uh, and uh, our understanding of the border is that it is, that it is a strip of land uh, extending as long as you want. So we can, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but that it is a commons. That is the resources, the infrastructure, the communities that we live in uh, and have lived in along the border are important and they constitute the commons and that we as residents of the border, as people who live close to the border, ought to understand the border as a commons uh, and uh, something that is very much entrusted to our care. We're gonna make the case that it is an important place to govern and to govern well, not just to govern, but to govern well. That is for the benefit of all the residents in the border and of course, uh, the book is a contribution that makes the case for how poorly really we are governing these binational commons, our land on both sides of the Rio Grande and of course the other Western part of uh, Mexico. So that's, uh, the, uh, uh, that's the book, the presentation of the book. Next uh, slide, please. Um, 
Let me uh, 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 then ask Pam to tell you a little bit about the genesis of this book uh, that you, I hope, will have a chance to read in the future. I'm very proud of this book, uh, and I hope you, you, uh, those of you who order it will enjoy it. Uh, but Pam will tell us a little bit about the genesis of it. Pam, please. Thank you, Tony, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are having a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for being with us today and to talk a little bit more about our edited volume. Uh, this next slide talks about the event and activities that went into this research project and how we ended up with such a great team of authors. So this all started back in uh, 2016 in February, the Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy launched a major research project on the US-Mexico border. Tony and I convened experts from academia, government, civil society, business sectors to a workshop at Rice um, to discuss the issues facing the border. Issues included uh, topics on economics, trade, security, human mobility, the environment, uh, public health, physical infrastructure, civil society, and public policy at different governmental levels by national, federal, state, and local. Yet our conversation kept going back to the U.S.-Mexico headlines. Um, at that time, the U.S. president election was heating up and we turned the discussion into exploring the ways we could show the border in a positive light under a new administration that clearly intended to use the border as a political pawn. This, of course, led to, to addressing what kind of institutions the border had generated for itself and their ability to withstand political hostility. This came with the central, what is the central question of our book, of uh, what is the state of cross-border institutions and how can they help counter the image of the border as defined by Washington, D.C.? Um, additionally, how can institutions contribute good governance to a binational commons? So at the first glance at the workshop, participants were not optimistic on the condition of cross-border institutions. Some appeared more institutionally developed than others, and many of the participants agreed that governance on the border is uneven and lacking, and the overall state of the U.S.-Mexico border institutional development falls well short of providing the quality and quantity of venues to tackle the problems facing borderlanders today. At the end of the workshop, the project's focus had instead shifted to the state of institutional development and governance on the U.S.-Mexico border. To follow up on this agenda, in 2016, the Center for United States and Mexico held a second workshop to refocus the discussion on the state of cross-border institutional development um, workshop attendees included over 30 cross-border companies and stakeholders. We also had with us Alan Burson, who was the then Assistant Secretary for International Affairs and the Chief Diplomatic Officer for the Department of Homeland Security of Office of Policy. Uh, he made initial remarks and set the stage up for discussion. And so uh, during that workshop, we uh, examined many of the mechanisms created by both countries to govern the border. This includes treaties, organizations, commissions, committees, working groups, forums, and so forth, uh, as well as their character and their historical evolution. The goal of this workshop was to carry out a cleared eye assessment of the state and the mechanisms linking to the two countries together and across the borderline and whether they provide adequate to, or good governance for the 21st century. These two workshops help us identify the experts we wanted at a, at a, uh, to write 
this edited volume and we asked them to contribute papers uh, on their expertise. So a year later in October 2017, we reconvened the authors here at the Baker Institute for a private author workshop. And this is one of the things that I think makes this edited volume so special that all of the authors were able to present their papers, receive feedback from the rest of the research team, and it really allowed us to get on the same page in terms of what we wanted for the uh, volume and for each chapter to flow. Um, as well, in April 2018, we had the opportunity for most of the authors to come with us to the Association of Borderland Studies Conference in uh, San Antonio to receive, to present and receive final feedback on their papers. And so I really want to take, you know, a second and thank all of the authors. Some of us, uh, some of them might be with us today. Uh, they put in so much time and effort to make such a great volume. And we are very thankful we ended up with such a great research team. And if we can turn to the next slide, please. So as you can see in this presentation, I put the uh, table of contents for the edited volume. We have 20 wonderful authors, 12 chapters, and the volume is organized in two parts. Part one reviews the theoretical and conceptual perspectives of the institutions. Uh, each chapter examines complex issues such as the historical and theoretical concepts of space and place governance, the overlapping and inconsistent territorial definitions of the border, data collection, interpretation, and distribution, and the structure of social networks in a binational context. Part two delves into the institutional universe and its governance at the US-Mexico border issue by issue. Each sector has its own institutions, mechanisms of cooperations, lessons to be learned, uh, practices to be shared, and areas for improved governance. The sectors explored in part two are local governments, environment, health, security, human mobility, transportation, and energy. Um, now I am going to turn it over for the next slide to uh, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I really appreciate that. Let me uh, first clarify, as I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, the uh, space, the border space, conceived in many different ways, and Pam will talk to us about that in a minute. Uh, it is a complicated environment, as you, as you well know, those of you who live close to the border. Uh, and there are many, many different uh, issues that run uh, through the border, human mobility, uh, illegal flows like uh, drugs, for example, workers that commute every day across the border, the governance of uh, natural resources, not the least of which is water, and of course now, this is a volume that includes a chapter on the issue of energy. We don't often think about energy, but the kind of exchanges of energy, natural gas and oil uh, and gasoline that is now going across the border into Mexico from Texas is enormous. And the kind of infrastructure that is being developed around the energy uh, sector is uh, considerable as well, as you know, in the Baja California Peninsula, also uh, ex, uh, energy, particularly electricity, is exchanged uh, towards California. Uh, and so all these different things are uh, sectors that move at different speed. They have their own interests. And as Pamela mentioned, they have different mechanisms for cooperation, collaboration, or even uh, simple coordination. Uh, so, when you think about the space, you also have to think about the kinds of institutions that exist to govern. Any space or any issue area, whether it is the economy or the stock market or energy or urban development and so on, has to have a scaffolding of institutions that allow the different actors and the different interests to come together and negotiate through these mechanisms whose priorities are going to prevail and how these different priorities from different actors are going to be integrated 
into public policy. The border space is a very different and curious kind of space because it is not a, 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 a particular, a, no particular issue, I guess, is contained within a single space. Uh, on the contrary, the issues often straddle the, the, the border. For example, if you think about the uh, Colorado River uh, river shed, it goes all the way down from Colorado to El Paso, Texas, and then down uh, uh, to become the binational border between Mexico and Texas. But it also involves many of the other tributary rivers that coming from Mexico onto the Rio Grande, and then the other tributary re uh, rivers that come from Texas and other places in New Mexico and Colorado into, into the river. And so these are issues that straddle, how to divide the water, who's going to use the water, how much water for each side, how much are the different farming communities on either side of the border going to get. And that's one issue. And then of course, you've got the Colorado River out there in uh, between Arizona and California coming down from uh, through Nevada as well. And you've been to the, to the uh, River Dam where Arizona and Nevada uh, 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 have this marvelous dam uh, just uh, uh, a, a little bit away from Las Vegas, Nevada. And you can see that those are uh, issues that straddle the border. So it's not just a very special space that requires institutions that pull the sovereignty of both countries, that allow Mexico and the United States to put aside for a minute their own concerns with their own sovereignty and put aside the conception of the nation state, the United States or Mexico, as the ultimate solution to their problems, because these are problems that straddle the borderline, and that requires that both countries come together and create joint mechanisms to be able to govern those spaces. What do we mean by institutions? Because institutions is a, a, a term that appears uh, prominently throughout the the volume, and in fact, in the, uh, in the title of the volume itself. Institutions can be defined as any established organizations. And I, I think we ought to make a very clear distinction about what an institution is and an organization is. An organization usually has a physical place, headquarters, a building, staff, a budget, and certain procedures that govern it. They are an institution, but not all institutions are organizations, and of course not, although all organizations may be institutions. Uh, an institution can also be a treaty, an agreement, an accord, a law, a practice, or a custom, the way that we view each other. Uh, marriage, for example, is an institution, even though it's not quite an organization, it could be called an institution. So what we wanted to do, as Pam did, is take a look at all these different laws and customs and forums and joint working groups and organizations and, uh, uh, and laws and treaties and agreements and accords, and then also the practices and the customs of the people who live on the border and cross the border and the way they do it. Because even the informal practices very often get institutionalized and become part of the way we do things. They shape our expectations. And so the border is a very complex place to govern because if you see all the different chapters, each of them has a load of uh, different items within each area, energy, uh, security, immigration, and human mobility, and on and on, and all of them require a number of organizations and laws and practices and, and so on to be able to govern. So it's very important that we keep in mind what institution means. And then, of course, if you have institutions, then you uh, uh, somehow protect the governance of that particular area, whatever that may be, infrastructure, uh, the ability of commuters to come and go. If you, are, if you have rules and regulations that are fully understood, are fully uh, institutionalized, they're embodied in the laws and the practices and the expectations of a community, then you would definitely have a community that is empowered because they, they can certainly hold the authorities, the bureaucrats, the politicians to the rules and the norms and they can say, hey, this is the way things are done, done. this is the, what the law says, this is what the rule says, and they can defend their own interests, and then there are channels for them to express their interests uh, and, and participate in good governance of a region 
uh, specifically a territory or a, an issue area. Uh, and of course, it protects them from political buccaneering. We've seen a lot of that in the last uh, uh, few years. I mean, President uh, Trump made the border one of his most important political footballs. He has certainly squeezed the border uh, for political profit, and he's done it very successfully. He obviously uh, talks to audiences in Kansas and, and, and Wyoming and Montana, and he talks about the border in a way that I think does not reflect the reality of the border. Only borderlands really truly know what the border is like and understand it. But he's able to portray it as a threat to national security, as being overrun by immigrants, as being a poor and violent place, as being a place that is completely uh, run by gangs and drug traffickers and, and, and refugee seekers, hordes of them, and of course, to, to, to give a simple or a simplistic uh, solution to these issues, which is a border wall, uh, questionable in terms of solving problems like human mobility, uh, uh, the, the, the ability of trade to flow, to be facilitated, and of course, uh, drugs to be stopped, since most of them actually come at the ports of entry and, and not really between ports of entry. So uh, uh, clearly there's a lot of political buccaneering, and I think the border has fallen prey to that. And as long as we, borderlanders, and those of us who are advocates of the U.S.-Mexico border, do not reconceive the area as a binational commons and then demand that institutions be built and created to run the place, to create good governance, and to allow our own interests to be integrated into the governance of the region, then uh, uh, it, we're always going to be prey to this kind of political buccaneering as we've seen in the last uh, uh, few years. So in that sense, I think the volume is quite uh, a call for building institutions or being careful because it does argue in some spaces that the institutions that are currently in place to govern the border are fully at risk. I think that what a community is able to do in terms of wealth in terms of uh, uh, being able to take advantage of the border as a resource depends on the institutions. Otherwise, we have chaos. Otherwise, we have arbitrariness by bureaucrats and politicians and opportunism in governing the border, and it becomes kind of chaotic. So to be able to, to, to create the kind of wealth and the kind of good governance, we need institutions. And by the way, more recently, uh, not included in the volume, but more recently, I began to read a little bit about how much wealthier the borderlands, the uh, uh, 16 counties of Texas, four in New Mexico, four in Arizona, and two in California, and the almost 40 municipalities that dot the Mexican side of the border uh, would be how much wealthier, really, how much uh, uh, richer they would be if they were allowed to operate more freely under a regulated and well-ordered way in which labor uh, markets can be integrated and people can take advantage, hedge the differences for production, for transportation, and for their own life. Instead, I think the scaffolding, the, 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 the law enforcement uh, 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 lopsided apparatus that we have built to govern the border tend to make the border uh, nearly an unlivable space, uh, a burdensome place for borderlanders and a place that most people just simply don't want to visit. They don't want to spend the two or three and sometimes even seven, eight hours that it takes to return to the other side of the border. So clearly we're making it very, very difficult. Um, I, I think the book is definitely a call for a change. The border has 15 million people and we have to make sure that these people participate in building the institutions to be able to magnify the potential of the region for themselves. That's 15 million people, more people than there are in, in most U.S. states. Next slide, please. Uh, as, I, as I was mentioning, uh, the, the borderlands is a very peculiar space because it is a place that both divides two countries. You have the United States and Mexico, and they each are entitled to their national sovereignty. And I think we've heard these words from President Trump quite a bit. Uh, but at the same time, it's a place that unites two peoples. It's a place that has its own demographics. It's a place that has its own history. And it's a place that demands its own policy. 
And this is where I think we have to think about the notions of space and place. This is not a place like any other. And I think in the book, we make the case that we need to reconceive and understand the border space as a binational commons that are to be governed uh, 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 jointly by the two countries. It doesn't, it doesn't annul, it doesn't cancel the ability of these two countries uh, to collaborate. It doesn't cancel their sovereignty. On the contrary, it kind of pools their sovereignty together to be able to govern uh, and, and establish practices of better governance. And I think the chapter by, uh, by Sergio Peña, which establishes borders of space as a unique space that requires its own policies and then traces all the different kinds of policy approaches that have tried, been tried at the border since World War II, at the end of World War II, all the way to our days with a very clear path, evolutionary path to the border, which goes from a more open border to a, a, a more closed border, which goes from a cooperative, more economic bent to the border, to a law enforcement, to now national security, and then of course, the uh, affecting the, in, the in, in, inhabil inhabitability of the border, the livability of that space, the quality of life of the space. And I think this is an, a, a, a chapter that talks about conceiving the border as kind of a Euclidean space, kind of a flat space that is to be divided, that is to separate two nations, that is to separate two people, that is to grant rights and, and citizenship uh, to either on their side and none to either on the other side. Instead, it must be conceived and reconceived as a binational commons, as a space that's more fluid, in which there ought to be some rights to residency on the border to be able to work and come and go. And that implies perhaps creating the kinds of visas that allow people to work on either side in an orderly and legal way and so on. So I think that he, uh, Sergio Peña, exposes quite well the limitations of the current approach thinking of that space as simply a flat space that divides. We need to think of it as a space that unites and creates the right institutions and the right practices to take advantage of the border as a resource. This is a theory that was expounded first by Christoph Son, the border as a resource, a place where these communities can leverage their similarities and their differences to create the institutions that will make everybody better off, everybody wealthier, and of course, uh, leverage them to be able to create uh, cer a certain degree of autonomy to govern themselves instead of having central authorities in Washington DC or Mexico City come and impose rules that often run right up against uh, the interests of local communities. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So this next slide is a chapter that Tony and I wrote on defining the border. And uh, this may be come to a surprise to a lot of people and it came to a surprise to us at the workshop when it emerged, uh, you know, when all of these politicians are constantly talking about the border, every time I always ask myself, what do you mean when you talk about the border? Because there are a lot of different territorial definitions that uh, you have to think about when you're talking about the border. The first thing you have to do is uh, look at the sheer size of the border population. Currently, there are 15 million residents along the US-Mexico border. This population is expected to double by 2025. That's not, uh, this, this, these chapters were written a couple of years ago, but now I realize, you know, it's just five years down the line and we still don't have the adequate governance that the border requires. The second definition uh, that grows in population is when you take into account the four U.S. states and the six Mex Mexican states. Uh, this definition is used by the Border Governance Conference because not you know, all of the trade that goes through the border, it expands and it goes throughout the state, throughout the US. And at the same time, the chapter that Tony and I wrote, we also took into consideration 
some of the statewide political motivations that can interfere with a broad consensus of the border definition. For example, in 1999, Senate Bill 501 uh, in the legislature of the state of Texas, which covers the longest stretch of the US-Mexico border, added several counties to their border region, including Bear County, which contains the San Antonio metropolitan area. And it, uh, you can ask yourselves right now, do you think uh, San Antonio is the border? I don't think so. But the legislature cited the growing population of Texas and Mexico and the number of residents uh, in the region who uh, lack access to state agency resources. So SB 501 brought the number of counties considered in Texas to be part of their border region to a total number of 43 counties and linked them directly to state public policies for the border region. The, uh, the next um, conflicting definition is one that's called, uh, that is like 100 air miles from any external boundary. That is a federal regulation by, uh, given by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection and the, the authority to operate within 100 miles of any external boundary. Uh, and that's where Border Patrol can operate immigration uh, checkpoints. Uh, this regulation establishing the 100 air miles was adopted by the Department of Justice in 1953 without any comment public comments or debate. At the time, there were fewer than 1,100 Border Patrol agents nationwide. Today, there are over 21,000. And when you take into account, that's roughly two thirds of the US population that live with this 100 mile zone. And this is, again, any external boundary. So that's about 200 million people. You have uh, state, the states of Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Hawaii, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and Vermont, all lying enti entirely or almost entirely within that area. So uh, clearly a fixed or standardized territorial definition is a complicated issue. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? I wanna show you a map that Tony and I created with all of the different uh, definitions of the border. Of course, there are advantages and disadvantages to having a just one definition and we're not arguing that the border needs to have one definition, but um, you do have to take into, a, into account the advantages and disadvantages and who is the population you are serving. So for, uh, for example, in the color teal, like this map is included obviously in our chapter. In the book, it's in black and white. So I'm very happy that I can share with, uh, with you all in color. So the, the teal uh, color is the 23 and 36 Mexican municipios and counties that directly touch the border. In purple, you have the La Paz counties and municipios, and that is probably the most common definition of the border, which was um, established in 1983 by the La Paz Agreement, which was signed in response to environmental problems in the border region. But even though that definition does not cover the full extent of cross-border watersheds and sub-watersheds. And then if you can take a look at the white band that covers the purple, which is the 100 kilometer La Paz definition. And if you can see the band, you can clearly see that the La Paz definition uses a linear measure of kilometers and miles. And so that does not conform to the political administrative bodies, the counties and municipios. So you basically have like half of a county or half a municipio that covers that part. You can also see in yellow the additional Texas counties I was talking about with uh, SB 501. And then in dark gray in Mexico on the bottom, you can see that uh, there is an expanded definition of what is the border region. And that is, that is used by the North Development, Development Bank, NetBank. Uh, and it was expanded in two, 2004 with 100 kilometers north and 300 kilometers south of the borders 
projects beyond those areas can also be eligible if they have a transboundary problem. And so, of course, you can see that these current definitions of the border, although we acknowledge that there are several and there doesn't have to be one alone, do not facilitate joint problem solving for the good and often makes problems worse. The management of the region should be shared as a basic level and, uh, should, begin, and should begin by reconsidering a more useful territorial definition for the population served. I am going to stop here and allow Tony to continue on the next slide. Thank you. Another of the big broader issues that I think we have to consider when it comes to governing the border, not just the uniqueness of the space and the territorial, the problems, the complications with the territorial definitions of the space itself and the different overlapping uh, um, issues that occur when you have different administrative agencies considering different types of territorial uh, uh, definitions of the border and different jurisdictional types of definitions of the border, administrative territorial and definition, that's, that, that is obviously quite complicated. But the third is another one. The United States and Mexico have not really fully agreed on the data that they collect, the kinds of data that they collect, or even the definitions of the data. Uh, this is quite important because how else can you actually, in a rational world, in the policy, in the, in the policy world, in a place where data, hard data, and, and, and hard definitions that are mutually agreed upon uh, are supposed to be the basis for public policy, how can you actually bring these two, uh, these two countries together if they're not even talking about the same thing? For example, employment, just to give you uh, one example, employment is defined differently on one side or the other. In the United States, we have a particular definition of employment. Uh, and in Mexico, anyone who is underemployed, employed part-time, or even self-employed, for example, those individuals that are selling stuff uh, in the streets in Tijuana and in Juarez and other places, as long as they're making a living, they're considered employed. Whereas in the United States, obviously, they would not be considered individuals who are employed in, in somebody's payroll with taxes being deducted and, and, and paying their own uh, their, their own taxes and so on. So clearly we have different definitions of this. So we cannot agree on all the data and the compa comparability or compatibility of the data collection between the US and Mexico, but that's not something that's entirely impossible. Um, let, me, uh, uh, let me be very clear about this. Uh, when the North American Free Trade Agreement was passed in 1994, for example, as the chapter explores, the United States and Mexico agreed on a very, very carefully crafted, uh, 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 elaborated and, and, and well-defined uh, uh, set of definitions and uh, a, a, a clear uh, uh, understanding of what a good was. Because a car made in North America required 62.5 of its labor and parts to be North American, then the NAFTA, then NAFTA agreement to the USMCA required that the two countries carefully do the accounting of what is down to a, uh, a, a screw, down to a tire, down to the a labor hour, down to a specific component, a wire, a part that goes into that car. So it, this is called the, is, is the, is an industrial schedule. And in there, it defines all the way down to the smallest of the parts that go into a vehicle, whether it is of this kind, of this, and, and by the way, it's classified interestingly because you've got chapter one screws, 1.1 on screws of one inch, 1.111 screws of this uh, material, one inch of this material, and the 1.1111 screws of this kind collected in this place and done in this, in this, uh, under this process or with this material. So it is quite possible for the two countries, in the case of Mexico, INEGI, the National uh, Institution for, the, uh, 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 for Statistics, geographic, uh, uh, Geographics and Information, and of course in the United States by the US Census and other agencies that collect data. It is quite possible that we agree on 
data collection, on definitions of bits of data, on meanings of specific concepts that we want to collect data on. And of course, uh, uh, that way academics who dedicate a lot of time to public policy and to the study of economics can have comparable data. One of the major obstacles of academics is that we often have to um, clean the data, so to speak, because we get a database from Mexico and a database from the United States, and then we have to try to figure out how to make it compatible to be able to say, okay, employment on the US side or the Mexican side is this, or employment on the border is this. But if we don't even use the same definitions or collect the same data, it's going to be very difficult. And this happens on many, many different issues. So it happens on infrastructure, it happens on, on uh, commuters, it happens on imports and exports, it happens on, on uh, all kinds of border flows. And it's very, very difficult to create institutional frameworks that actually work upon which you can cement policy if you don't even if you're not even talking about the same data, you're talking past each other and you're not really uh, 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 dealing with comparable uh, data. So Pam, next. By the way, this is a great chapter and I think that you ought to, uh, uh, you ought to take a, a very close look at it because on some things we know how to be compatible, but we haven't gone much beyond NAFTA, the interests of business, which does have an interest in creating such schedules of comparable data into other areas where there are less urgent interests uh, in, in creating comparable data for our cross-border studies. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> I also would like to add that at, in this webinar, we are not covering all of the chapters. Uh, we're just giving kind of a brief summary of uh, uh, just highlighting some of the chapters, but um, all of these chapters are so interesting. I love the data one. Um, this next slide is about two of our chapters in the edited volume, one by Victor Daniel Jurado Flores and Cecilia Sarabia Rios, and the other by Manuel Gutierrez and Kathleen Stout. Um, they both look at local actors and social networks. Um, the first one in social networks, uh, Victor, Jura, Victor Jurado and, and Cecilia Sarabia, they look at cross-border networks and specifically looking at both formal and informal. And that's very difficult sometimes because of course there's formal collaboration, but sometimes there's very important informal networks that are made through organizations from people who are interested and reach out to other organizations. and. So, so no matter how difficult it is to generate good cross-border governance, there is an increasing expectation of cooperation among the diverse actors, like in civil society, uh, economic entrepreneurs, government, and policymakers. And so, for example, in Manny and Kathy's chapter, they delve into the local and state government efforts that are also very valuable to border governance. Their chapter looks at the ways that federal and state policies incentivize or shape binational cooperations, or even if it's in its absence. Uh, they also look at the primary issues that draw on political institutions, government bodies, civil societies, and even turnout in elections. Um, the authors also discuss current and proposed solutions and identify best practices, ideas, and programs. I'm going to let Tony uh, delve more into the issue of what is the democratic deficit at our borderlands, uh, but the authors also uh, uh, delve into this issue. And so, for example, the U.S. and Mexico enact legislation mostly at the federal level that affects the border region with priorities and agendas set in Washington, D.C. and Mexico City. Typically, national security trumps other laws. At local level, it depends on what happens in their neighboring cities. The authors explored, for example, San Diego and Tijuana as a good model of cooperation. They look at, uh, you know, all of the, the border cooperation and economic development initiatives and organizations that include, like, the San Diego Regional Economic Development Corporation, the Cali Baja 
mega region, the Tijuana Economic Development Council, the city and county of San Diego, the municipality of Tijuana, the San Diego Association of Governments, SANDAG, the Metropolitan Transit System, and the California Department of Transportation, among others. And it's worth mentioning that these agencies operate locally as opposed to some of the larger organizations that spring from the federal government. And the Kali Baja region, as the authors explore, is a great case of cooperation and positive relationship across cities strengthened by state governments. And in this region, one can see the Tijuana's municipal president assisting a city council meeting in San Diego, a binational meeting with Mexican regidores and council members, or San Diego's border relations office in Tijuana. Uh, the San Diego Tijuana case contains different projects such as economic development forums, uh, planning and coordination committees, marketing development, tourist promotion, and a recycling market development zone. So by actively promoting some of these activities such as tourism and cities, they market themselves as a region, not as individuals, and they seek to attract people this way. And this is an example of how cities can win both sides by cooperating. And of course, the authors, Kath, uh, Manuel and Kathy Stout, um, kind of add, say that there are still a lot more research necessary to unpack local governments, civil society, media, and participation in the US-Mexico borderlands. And, but the authors make a pioneering start to look at these specific cases more closely. I am going to turn to the next slide, please, and turn it over to Tony. Thank you, Pam. Um, we have a couple of chapters on security cooperation. Uh, as you might already intuit, uh, uh, this has been perhaps the hegemonic approach uh, to governing the US-Mexico border. Uh, there is a great book by McAdam Flixton and McAdam uh, that looks at the, uh, well, actually it's a book that is still coming out. It's a book that we're gonna publish with the University of Toronto Press as well. Uh, and it is a book that looks at the border as a strategic field of action in which some, uh, uh, some uh, actors are incumbents and some actors are challengers. In the, in, the, in the border area, we think that the security agencies are the incumbents. They are the ones that hold the units of governance. They are the ones that determine who can cross, who cannot cross, when can they cross, under what conditions they cross, and of course they couch their uh, uh, almost discretionary decisions on what crosses and when and how uh, on the basis that they are protecting the nation from security threats, everything from the caravans of migrants to uh, uh, drug, traf uh, drug trafficking cartels uh, to potential terrorist attacks. Uh, there are many, many different layers for this. For example, Octavio Rodriguez Ferreira explores some of the very local connections that take place, uh, let's say, in the San Diego and Tijuana area, where the local sheriff's department, the local police communicates with the police in Tijuana. This also happens, for example, between fire departments in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, where they actually communicate if there is, or at least they have an accord to communicate if there is an emergency uh, across the border. They, they cannot cross. Uh, in fact, they would need a special kind of insurance uh, because they're not covered. Their insurance fire department uh, members, for example, their insurance would not cover them if they went to what is to aid in some natural, in some, in some uh, disaster in the maquiladora, some chemical spill and things like that. They would need a special uh, insurance if they don't go. But they do understand that it is important that if something happens on one side, they be able to communicate with their counterparts. And in some places, they even train together. They go to the firing range and they communicate. So there's a lot of informal communication among local authorities. They're, the governor of Tamaulipas and the, and the agencies in South Texas, for example, also established something that they call the hotline so that, that they can also track the kinds of criminals that may be US citizens cross into Mexico, collaborate with organized crime, commit a crime and then cross into Texas. And then they take advantage of this gap in the borderline 
to take refuge in the United States until things kind of come down. That happens a lot on the border. Some people are dual citizens and so on. So clearly there are some struggles between the two countries, but at the end of the day, security reigns supreme and the United States and Mexico have not been able to find a system that balances both security and prosperity. I'm not saying that security should be sacrificed but it should be balanced against the prosperity interests of the region and the prosperity interests of borderlanders. Is that something that we have not been able to achieve? And, and of course, Guadalupe uh, Correa uh, Cabrera and Evan McCormick deal with the construction of the border as a threat, something that we have seen under the Trump administration quite a bit. I mean, there is a rhetorical construction of the border as a dangerous place uh, often when I am asked if the, if the border is a, if there is a border crisis, I tell them that the border has never been under greater operational control than today. And there have not been less immigrants trying to breach the border, crossing to the United States between ports of entry, probably since the late 1960s, early 1970s. So the border is not truly in a crisis but perpetuating the discourse, the rhetorical approach to the border as a crisis is politically profitable. And I think they show that quite clearly. In addition to that, of course, we have to understand that when you give an agency a mission, there's often what we call mission creep because they will uh, instead disengage from resolving the problem. Ultimately, many of these agencies are not interested in resolving the problem because then they become uh, completely dispensable. Instead, they're more interested in problem maintenance. Uh, and, and then you, they create this vested interest in the problem, in maintaining the problem, in maintaining the definition of the problem according to the mission, what benefits their prestige, their budgets, their gadgets, their influence, and so on. So they create bureaucratic interests. And, and then you have this uh, uh, feeding uh, uh, loop between politicians who benefit from the political rhetoric, uh, uh, bureaucrats who benefit from the budgets that rain down from the politicians, and of course the companies like those that are building the border wall who benefit from the contracts and in turn lobby the politicians to, to, to uh, uh, put more money into the bureaucracies who then give them the contracts and then they lobby the politicians and you create these these loops or these golden triangles. And I think security is in that loop. And we need to reconsider the issue of security jointly. We need to figure out a way in which we can secure the border, but it, through a binational mechanism. And as of right now, I think there's a very low distrust, partly because the Mexican police forces are very, uh, in, uh, um, really just not trained, not, not capable of aiding in this. And of course, accused of corruption and even collaboration uh, with uh, drug traffickers and other organized criminal groups. And so there's very low levels of trust. We need to increase the levels of trust to increase uh, the, the building of uh, formal mechanisms. And then of course, ultimately achieve interoperability so that the border can be governed on the security basis, but together and balanced uh, with the issue of prosperity. Pam, uh, I think the next uh, slide is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this next slide is about the transportation institutions along the U.S.-Mexico border. Kimberly Collins wrote this chapter. It is a great chapter because she starts off by providing a picture of the complexity of the uh, border transportation network. And, you know, just to give you an example, on a typical day, Customs and Border Protection, this is from fiscal year 2019, you have per day over 1 million passengers and pedestrians, over 200,000 incoming private owned vehicles, over 78,000 truck, rail, and sea container, containers, and approximately $7.3 billion worth of important products a day. So the sheer volume and mix of cross-border transportation are just but one dimension to consider. There are also a number of challenges to the transportation network. For example, there's the cost of border wait times and the goods to get across that has been estimated uh, to be up to a 7.2 billion um, 
and impact over uh, 62,000 jobs in this, just in the San Diego and Baja California border region. And the problem of wait times has been increasingly uh, significant in, along the border and it's getting worse as border agencies uh, assert themselves in border governance with a very security focused primary mission, which largely leaves their obligations to facilitate cross-border traffic. Um, and Kimberly Collins' chapter addresses the binational cooperation and transportation and looks at the examples of uh, border states. Like most of border states, they've developed a border master plan as part of their US-Mexico Joint Working Committee on Transportation Planning, JWC. And there is like a universe of, of institutions and organizations that work to kind of uh, move uh, trade and transportation through the Federal Highway Administration, the State's Department of Transportation, Mexican border states, and then you have including like organizations like the Department of State, the Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, the U.S. General Service Administration, GSA, and um, also to help out readers in our edited volume, we include a list of all of the organizations that are mentioned in our edited volume in the beginning, um, because it is a universe of institutions that work across the U.S.-Mexico border. And so uh, Kimberly Collins concludes with that as we're moving to a new century of border technologies, you also have to take into account the public-private partnerships and the management of the border system and the need for an interconnected network of institutions that embrace border flows and that need to be developed and maintained. And um, usually what we're missing in other areas of institutional development, of course, is the political will to invest and build a network further. And so all of this is gonna impact the, the future of cross-border travel. Next slide, please. This next slide is on uh, the chapter on human mobility, which of course a a book without a chapter on human mobility and immigration would not be complete. And this, uh, this chapter is by Tony Payan, myself, and from a colleague, uh, Carla Perez Villarreal. She's in Mexico. And so we start off by saying, of course, there's little doubt that the US-Mexico border region is one of the most you know, economically and demographically dynamic areas in the world and the, has a very high level of human and vehicle mobility, perhaps on the planet, including documented mobility and undocumented immigration. And so obviously it, it entails an extensive collaboration between state, federal, and local authorities, of, of, of course with civil society groups, all of which you know, must cooperate to ensure the cross-border mobility is both legal and legitimate, and that undocumented mobility is reduced to minimum and prevented from affecting the binational relationship. The U.S. Mexico, the U.S. and Mexican governments have not always seen eye to eye on the issue of human mobility, but over time they will have to find ways to collaborate to attempt to balance security and prosperity. In this chapter, we focus on providing a historical overview of human mobility regulation we focus on how it went from a labor issue to a law enforcement issue to a national security issue. Each state with important implications for borderlanders and the way bureaucrats have changed and managed the human mobility at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we obviously explore the main institutions including the bureaucracies or organizations themselves and discuss their progression, their challenges, their opportunities for deeper collaboration in an increasingly mobilized world. It's also important to note that this chapter deals with both documented and undocumented flows at the US-Mexico border because a lot of people always focus on the undocumented immigration, but the legal immigration that crosses the border every day, the people who get up and, you know, go to the ports of entry and do their line and have to sit and wait 
uh, to cross the border are, um, you know, are always impacted by some of these, uh, uh, these laws and regulations that kind of do not facilitate cross-border mobility. So we have to ask, so if the resident population at the border is projected to increase, why is it taking longer and longer to cross the border? Inspection times have become more lengthier. Border authorities have not figured out a way to sort out the admissible population from the inadmissible population in a way that facilitates border crossing by those who can exercise that right. And of course, the U.S. Government Accountability Office, GAO, has reported several challenges on this, which is including infrastructure and staffing needs, better data and collection methodologies, um, and it all points to a system to, that is actually becoming less efficient. So obviously, as uh, uh, Kimberly Collins uh, addressed it in her chapter as well, Political will is something that's super important to reconceive the border as it is needed, along with creativity, innovation in public policy and institutional design. We have to obviously balance, consider ways to balance security and prosperity, not only in practice, uh, but in practice and not only in rhetoric. And it's only important to ensure that borderlanders have a say in institutional design and the ability to verify that the border management agencies do not develop a vested interest that run directly against the interest of border residents. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tony. Yeah, I'll try to be very brief so we can leave some time for, for a, a conversation with you because I think we're hitting an hour now. Um, our final conclusion is that a, the border is very unevenly developed when it comes to institutions to govern the border. Uh, in some cases, like the uh, uh, issue of water with, through the 1944 treaty and the institutionalization of the IBWC, the International Boundary and Water Commission. It is slightly more developed, although Stephen Mummy and Irasima Coronado, the authors of that chapter, make the case that it is an institution at risk, that it needs to be modernized. 1944, it's not 2020, so it's been a while, 75 years, it needs to be truly, truly modernized. Uh, and in other issues, we're simply just talking past each other, like on security. On others, the United States is adopting a very unilateral approach, such as in, on, on human mobility. So in many, many different ways, the two countries are not quite in sync for a number of reasons. There is a power asymmetry. There is a different conception of interests. Uh, there are different definitions of the problem, and there are very few uh, channels to actually dialogue to try to achieve consensus on how to do this. But that's a, an institution, that, that's a failure of leadership. The, the un, underdevelopment of institutions to govern the U.S.-Mexico border is ultimately a failure of leaders. Leaders have to sit down and instead of the political buccaneering that we've seen uh, lately regarding the border, they need to sit down and figure out joint definitions, common institutions for effective uh, governance. Uh, as long as the leaders do not want to do that and they see it profitable to simply uh, uh, dismiss the border and even portray it as a threat, uh, we're not going to achieve the kind of leadership and political will that we're going to need. And the other problem is the democratic deficit, as Pamela mentioned. Uh, the opinions and the views of borderlanders, local communities in Nogales, in, in Tecate, in, 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 in El Centro, in uh, you know, Ciudad Acuña and different places are never really consulted. Most of the governance is top-down. It's a top-down approach. It's a federal government down to the local communities um, and they have very little say. There are no venues for the local communities to actually come up with their own innovative ideas, their own understanding and do a lot of self-governance. At the US-Mexico border, there is a lot of imposition, authoritarian imposition on the way the border is governed that would not be tolerated in many different communities in central Pennsylvania or in Iowa or in Idaho. So I think borderlanders suffer not just from this overburdensome uh, apparatus, uh, security apparatus that is all top down, but they also do not have any 
ways to express their own desires about the kinds of communities that they want to see, especially cross-border communities. But the border continues to be a great resource, and we need to see it as a resource. As I mentioned, I think the border would be a much, much wealthier, richer place if the communities were empowered to participate in cross-border governance. The mayors don't have any power to do that. At best, they can conclude certain agreements between them that have very little, uh, very few uh, real teeth, uh, that is budget and, and, and binding, a, a kind of a binding agreement. They're very few and far between. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, that means that we're never gonna move to truly binational border management where US bureaucrats, Mexican bureaucrats work shoulder to shoulder on managing border flows, on improving the quality of life, the inhabitability of the space, and of course the institutions themselves to be updated for the needs of the 21st century. I'll stop there and then I think we can open it to, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you both very much for your presentation and it's a very interesting topic. We've got some questions coming in and if, if anybody does have questions, please put them in the chat for us and uh, we'll bring you on and allow you to ask your question. Well, I'd like to start with one real quickly is, is, are there any models around the world for what you're kind of proposing in this binational commons? Are there other areas where something like this has been developed? Well, I think the closest uh, model is, of course, the European Union. Uh, um, and I'm not talking about the border between Germany and France, which is an easy one to talk about because they're uh, relatively equal countries, their income is relatively equal, and they're both uh, developed countries, and they kind of have actually built institutions to trust each other. We're talking about the kinds of institutions that occur, say, between Germany and Poland, where you have a much, much or a, a, a more open uh, 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 type of income. Uh, German, German income is of course much higher than Poland, that Poland is a much uh, a less developed country than Germany, and yet they have found ways to collaborate, they have found ways to have an open border to create the kinds of, of uh, 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 documents that people can use to go back and forth. This is all couched in the European Union, of course, but I think that would be a much greater example. A few other examples, of course, would be the treatment that Bulgarians or Hungarians have in the rest of the European Union. Not every border is the same within the European Union. So we would have to take a look at different borders and see what are some of those institutions, practices, and regulations that would fit the US-Mexico border. Um, the, the power differentials, the income differentials, they all matter. But I think we may be able to find some good examples in the, uh, in the European Union uh, that that might aid in building a unique system for North America. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from John Bernal. If John, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, you, you mentioned the International Boundary and Water Commission um, and its need for modernization, but were, were there aspects of that long-standing institution that might have uh, suggestions for other institutions that are struggling these days? Yeah, Pam, would you like to say something and then I'll, I'll, I'll go as well. Sure, I wanna say that we didn't have time, obviously in this presentation to address, we also have an environmental and uh, chapter written by Stephen Mummy and Irasema Coronado uh, that delves into, I think it is called Institutions at Risk because some some things in the environmental sector are being placed at risk, but uh, IBWC is a wonderful example of the type of collaboration that can be achieved between both countries. Yeah, I, I want to add something to that because you're absolutely right. I think this is the better governed area between the two countries because the two countries in the 1944 treaty created the kind of water exchanges that are to occur between the U.S. sends water to Mexico in the Colorado River watershed or the river shed, and then Mexico sends water to Texas on the Conchos River and the Rio Grande uh, river shed. And I think it, 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 the IBWC SILA is a perfect example of how the two countries can collaborate. Uh, they work very closely uh, 
uh, and uh, but there but there are. Um, I, I think the argument that Iracema Coronado and Stephen Mummy are making is that at the end of the day, these institutions are at risk because they have two major gaps that we have to think about. The first one is, of course, deficiencies in the treaty itself. Two examples of these deficiencies, of course, would be the fact that it doesn't provide for rationing of water under drought conditions. And we've seen, for example, that the Mexican National Guard is now confronting farmers because Mexico has to pay the water and, uh, and the farmers in Chihuahua think that the water belongs to them and, their, and the reservoirs are essentially for their next agricultural cycle. And so there's clashes between farmers in Chihuahua uh, under these extreme drought conditions and the National Guard. Uh, that is, I think, one deficiency that the treaty uh, has. The other deficiency, of course, is that it deals with surface water, but it doesn't deal with underground water. So uh, underground water, everybody can just dig in and, 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 and uh, siphon as much water as they can, even though some of these bolsons kind of straddle the border. So that is definitely something that needs to be updated. Uh, and of course, sanitation issues, dealing with sewage, raw sewage, and pollution in the rivers and, and quality of the quality of water and so on are things that these institutions. So even though this institution is great, it's the best that the two countries have been able to provide and to create, and there are still deficiencies and there are still challenges that are coming up. And I think that uh, they, they also need to update it. And I think that's the basis for calling them institutions at risk. Thank you for your, your observation. Thank you. We have a question from a gentleman named Robert, who is asking about uh, COVID implications, I think. Robert, do you want to ask your question? If you can unmute yourself. <clears throat> I, see Robert, uh, I see Robert on the screen now. I... I uh, well, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll start off by answering the question. Thank you, Robert, for uh, asking that. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic was not featured in this edited volume, and it was because we um, ended up with the edited manuscript around April. And so, uh, of course, the COVID pandemic has uh, kind of thrown into question all types of issues of governance at the U.S.-Mexico border. The wait times are unbearable. Uh, the last time I went to Ciudad Juarez, I did four hours at the port of entry. And so, um, no, I mean, the COVID pandemic will definitely need, need to have another edited volume on that. Uh, but Tony, if you have anything else to add on this. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things about the COVID pandemic. Obviously, it's been a tragedy on both sides. Lots of people dead, lots of people sick. Uh, and the only response the U.S. Mexico, uh, the U.S. and Mexico both have been able to uh, carry out is to shut down the border. Not completely, not like the Canadian uh, U.S. border. Um, it, the the, the U.S.-Mexico border remains open, but only for U.S. citizens and U.S. residents who are still able to go into Mexico and come back. Mexican citizens are completely barred from entering the United States and moving back and forth, partly because the Trump administration said that uh, they were bringing in COVID uh, from Mexico, the reality is that COVID has been on both sides. Again, this is an example of the political problem uh, of using the border as a political football. Uh, but um, but the, both sides of the border have suffered quite a bit. My experiences with El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, of course, where there's been lots and lots of cases uh, and, uh, and lots of distrust in the institutions that used to deal with cross-border public health, like the Pan American Health Organization, shut down its doors in 2014. And it's very unfortunate because this is an organization that existed, that was created, I think, 70 years before 2014. It had been there for back, I think, back to the to the 1940s, and it had been in place, and it could have coordinated a response, monitoring uh, cases, uh, aiding, because there were there, it was a binational institution as well, much like IBWC, and they could have done a terrific job at advising agencies, monitoring the problem on both sides, collecting data, and doing this kind of work. But PAHO is gone. Uh, the, the Pan American Health Organization 
closed its El Paso offices, and now the two systems are completely back-to-back, -back, separated, unable to communicate. And of course, the only, the first instinct of the security bureaucracies is we're gonna shut down the border. Uh, uh, top down, all we, obviously the local communities were never consulted. Uh, it, that, this is an order that came all the way down from the top, from, from Washington DC and President Trump, and the border communities are left to suffer. Uh, this is a good example of how everybody suffers when there is no coordination, no collaboration, no cooperation and no institutions to truly, truly help both communities on both sides deal with the, uh, with the problem. Our next question is from Juan Gallardo. Juan, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Juan, are you there? Go ahead and unmute yourself. You're on. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, I was uh, wondering in, uh, in regarding um, what is the balance of power? Who, who has uh, or think that um, has the ability to convince the other partner that uh, is um, advisable um, to negotiate? And uh, usually, um, <clears throat> There is a perception on some or, or one of the partners that uh, they have more rights or has more power than the other. So I wonder, I didn't hear anything in, in the presentation if uh, that is an issue that uh, has been considered. Well, most importantly, like I would want to say that it should be the border communities that should have the power and should have the say, and they don't. And so unfortunately, border communities are the ones who have to just suffer through and are the ones who, you know, have to adapt to these new regulations. But most mm -hmm. of the issues that or policies that affect the U.S.-Mexico border all obviously come from the nation's capitals, both uh, Washington DC and Mexico City. And that's why Tony was talking at the end of the presentation about a democratic deficit that is in the border. And it's because very little voice and say is for border residents. And so that is something that needs to change and they need to be more consulted in the processes that affect their cross border mobility and the issues affecting the borderlands. Tony? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of things to add to, to uh, as, a, as a reply to, to Juan Gallardo. Uh, yes, I, I think that like in every other human activity area, uh, clearly um, power is a factor and everything that happens is necessarily filtered through power relations. And what we have on the US-Mexico border is an asymmetrical relationship where the United States holds uh, greater power, greater income. Uh, it's obviously a world power and Mexico is kind of a medium power, kind of a, a developing nation with less resources and less, less prowess and wherewithal to implement policy or even to sway the United States in the direction of creating uh, binational mechanisms. And that is reflected because it, it means that the United States has the ability to unilaterally impose certain conditions, certain mechanisms and certain institutions, and it does. Security, I think the, the weight of security in governing the border is one of those examples. It obeys the priorities of the United States, particularly after 1994 with immigration and after 2001 with terrorism. And that is, I think, uh, uh, an important thing to consider. There are two other texts that I think are important to think about. Uh, one is by David Newman, um, uh, in, in, where he explores the, uh, the idea that, that through borders run, uh, runs power uh, and, and no, no two borders are the same and there's a lot of power exercised. He was talking about the Israeli-Palestinian border, of course, where power is exercised often in a raw way uh, with very few rights for the Palestinians. But of course, he was uh, uh, also talking about borders in general. And the other one is a book also published by the University of Arizona Press called uh, The Borders of Inequality by Inigo More, a Spanish uh, author who compares just the income and wealth in 17 borders around the world and, and how the, 
uh, is, is kind of a way of explaining how different countries deal with governance and effectively where the power differential is too great. Uh, usually the, uh, the, the stronger partner tends to impose unilaterally uh, its mode, its priorities and therefore its mode of governance as it is the case in the United States. We have a question uh, from Tom Rayburn, and uh, he's asking something that a couple of people have asked for. Tom, if you'd like to unmute yourself. So my question is, it's to compare and contrast how the, the U.S.-Canadian border works uh, within a binational co commons frame versus the uh, U.S.-Mexican border. Are there lessons to be learned? Does one border work better than the other? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Uh, we, uh, both Pam and I, are members of the ABS, Association for Borderland Studies, and many of our colleagues uh, that meet with us every April in different venues for our annual conference uh, are from Canada. Um, they come from Ottawa, they come from Toronto, they come from Montreal, and they come from Victoria. Uh, uh, Vancouver, uh, Alberta, and so on. And I can tell you that uh, uh, the, the border between the US and Canada used to be a very open border. Canadians were able to come and go with just a driver's license. Uh, it was a, uh, you know, a, a fairly, an undefended border really, a thousand border patrol agents uh, for, for 4,000 miles of border. Uh, Canadians never had any complaints. The infrastructure was very good. The economic integration was very good. But in the last few years, Canadians, uh, as I hear them, as I interact with them and I attend their panels, have begun to complain that there is a process of Mexicanization of the U.S.-Canadian border. As the United States gets increasingly more anxious, uh, as the angst about American security grows, uh, the U.S., and, and, and certainly with the Trump administration, the U.S. has retrenched into a much more nationalistic instead of a regional uh, understanding of security into a much more closed and nationalistic basis for ensuring its public safety and security and national security, and that means shutting down the border. So our Canadian friends are complaining increasingly of this, what they call the Mexicanization. Um, uh, it used to be, I think, facilitated by the fact that Canada and the United States you know, are, are, uh, you know, share a culture, uh, a language, uh, a, a tradition of uh, a rule, uh, rule of law, of institutions, and so on. So it was understanding. It was understandable that Mexico was a little bit more of an outlier in North America because it was so different. But I think uh, the U.S. has adopted a position which is now viewing Canada also as kind of a, a, a potential source of threats, and that's affecting the way the Canadian uh, border is being managed where it used to be really an example of an open border. Our next question is from Jerry Aldridge. Uh, if you'd like to come on and ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, actually I have a couple thoughts. Well, one question I raised was what you think of this new trade agreement that Trump has negotiated. Um, the other observation I had is I crossed the Mexican border at Laredo and Nogales like 40 years ago. It was not a big deal. You went over for lunch, you know, to shop. And then I crossed the border at Nogales a few months ago and I could not believe it with the wall and this fortress. And I was actually embarrassed. I mean, I just feel like, well, first of all, this is all you're saying is one more reason for all of us to vote and get the Trump administration out of here, out because what they're doing is ridiculous. But, but it was really kind of frightening to see this fortress. You know, there were still people going across shopping and all, but the mood of the whole place had changed drastically in the last, you know, 40 years. Do you think that was partly because of 9-11 or what caused all of that? Yeah. Pam, would you like to take a, a first step or you yes. want to do it? <laughs> yes, uh, I'll let you deal with the USMCA. Uh, of course, we did have a chapter that was going to talk about the USMCA and David Gantz was the author on that. However, because uh, obviously it was a lot 
a, a very important topic on the news. We decided to publish that paper instead in the, at the Baker Institute. And Tony can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, yes, 9-11 changed the process to a lot more of a militarized border. And uh, I mean, as someone who is from the borderlands, I'm from El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. I mean, I have two houses, one in El Paso, one in Juarez. I, uh, when growing up, I crossed the border every day going back and forth, but now it's, I can't, I can't do it. You know, you have to kind of uh, make your day and say, I might be three hours early, might be three hours late. Just, it depends on how the, how the line is. And we can't live this way, people who, you know, who study across, who work across, that is nothing, not sustainable in the long term and things need to change. Um, and whether if it's a new administration that's coming in or uh, under another, the, the same administration, um, you know, there needs to be more attention, more discussion on facilitating cross-border travel for cross-border residents. Tony? Yeah. Uh, indeed, I think I agree with Pam. I think the militarization began when Sylvester Reyes became the Border Patrol chief. Uh, having been in the military, I think he imported a lot of the military tactics in the training and the recruiting of the Border Patrol. So we started seeing that back in the 1990s. But 2001 accelerated the militarization of the border. And of course, the 2007, uh, let's see, I think it was 2007 uh, Border Wall uh, Act. Uh, that was uh, passed under President uh, Bush, uh, began sort of building the wall. So when Trump came into office, the wall was already 700, almost 700 miles long. And of course, it's now accelerated by, by, by uh, President Donald Trump. Um, so I, I, I see a kind of a historical climb. Slowly, the United States kind of retrenching, feeling greater angst, creating greater insecurity, uh, greater unwillingness to, uh, unwillingness to build the region as a whole, uh, um, not, not necessarily a European Union type of region, but a region that is more prosperous, more, more open and more cooperative uh, to achieve both security and prosperity. With the USMCA, that's a really interesting question. Uh, to me, the president made a big deal out of NAFTA. He criticized NAFTA. He, uh, uh, he said he was going to repeal NAFTA, that people were taking up you know, we're abusing the United States and on and on, all the rhetoric that we've heard of it. And at the end of the day, what is the USMCA, the successor to NAFTA? About 85% of it is the same, uh, didn't, didn't change, uh, and about 15% is different. Of that 15% that changed, uh, some things are probably better. I mean, there's a chapter on electronic commerce, obviously 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when NAFTA was being negotiated, we couldn't buy music on the internet, software on the internet, you know, this kind of electronic trade that we have now. So that needed to be updated. Uh, the chapter on energy ended up being very weak, uh, but it's there. So some things uh, needed to be there. Uh, some things were designed to make Mexico less competitive, like the increase in wages and labor standards and environmental standards on Mexico, not because we comply with them, but because we uh, you know, we obviously saw that Mexico had a policy of wage suppression, and we wanted to make sure that that, that, that they were not taking advantage of that. So it could have been uh, something that the Trump administration had in mind. They also did it with China in mind. There's a China clause 32.10, in which every party to the USMCA is, uh, um, uh, is essentially forbidden from engaging in a trade agreement with China un unless the other parties agree to it. You have to be consulted, giving the U.S. de facto veto over Mexico's ability to, to engage in a, a free trade agreement with China. Uh, and on some things it's worse, uh, like uh, it, it raises the, uh, the bar for the percentage of the content of a particular good to be able to consider, to be considered a North American good and be exempt of the um, tariff uh, as it crosses the border. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think the president realized, oh, NAFTA is a good thing. I mean, it works, a few things, tinker with some things, some good, some bad, and, and, uh, and here we have an agreement. My guess is that the president used it as a political football. All these updates and modernization items could have been, could have been done without canceling NAFTA, without threatening and making all kinds of noise and threats and all that. All that, you know, 
uh, jumping up and down for what to end up with an agreement that looks very much the same, a little better in some things, a little worse in other things. It could have done been done without without all that uh, uh, all that kicking and screaming. But you know the president is who he is, and he likes it, and uh, and and he he wanted to profit politically from it, and we ended up with the same thing. Well, we're right at the hour and a half mark, and we really appreciate your um, presentation today. And I, I have one last thing I'd like to ask because I, I talked to uh, Tony about this in a practice session, but would you mind telling everybody a little bit about the Baker Institute at Rice and, and uh, uh, your role in it and in the bigger picture of it all? Because I, I found it very interesting. Yes, there is a new book uh, that I also recommend. It's called The, the Man That the Man That ran Washington, I think. Uh, it's on, on Secretary Baker's, uh, 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 I guess, biography. And uh, Mr. Baker, when they, when President Bush lost the election in 92, Mr. Baker came, came back to Houston uh, and he was approached by Rice University to, to uh, create the Baker Institute for Public Policy, much like a Balfour Institute at Harvard or the Hoover Institution at Stanford. So it's the Baker Institute at Rice. It is now the, I think, third, uh, uh, is a third place among university-based think tanks. Uh, it's made of centers. And eight years ago, um, I came to Baker Institute to work on immigration. And seven years ago, uh, in August, uh, I founded the uh, Mexico Center at the time, now Center for the United States in Mexico. Uh, and we do, all Mexico, Mexican politics, security, e economics, uh, immigration, border issues, uh, Mexican democracy, and uh, uh, and uh, other issues that pertain to Mexico and the binational relationship. We are one of the uh, think tanks on Mexico, and I'm very proud of that center. There's other centers at the Baker Institute that are also very successful, but that's what we are. And so we are a resource, I hope, for the public policy community and for the public uh, to know and understand the binational relationship better. And hopefully our ultimate goal is a public policy center to get to better policy. Well, thank you all again for your time and uh, everybody, uh, their binational commons book by U of A Press, we put links out there for you on the chat. It's also on our website, I'm and uh, Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody else for joining us today. And uh, we will see you in a week and have a great week at Ollie. Take Thank care. You. Bye -bye. Thank you both. Yeah.